In the spirit of giving for the holiday season, we did an extended interview with Scott Harrison, the founder of Cherry to Water. There are a few people I'm confident whose names will be remembered in 100 years, and Scott's is one of them. He is truly an inspiration. Enjoy and happy holidays. Scott, so first off, before we get into your personal story, tell us, end state, how big a business is Charity Water? How many wells? How much money raised? Yep. Uh, so we're in our 11th year, yep. uh, about $270 million raised. Uh, we've been able to fund 24,000 water projects yep. in 24 countries for 7 million people. All right. So quarter of a billion dollars raised. It's, get us to get us to day zero. Tell us tell us about Scott Harrison, <laughs> right up until uh, uh, the the launch of this thing, and what inspired you and brought you to this. Well, it's an unlikely yeah. uh, unlikely path. I was yep. a nightclub promoter uh, yep. for ten years in New York City. I moved. That's how we met. That's how we met. I moved here at eighteen, uh, kind of partying lifestyle. Eighteen to twenty eight, worked at forty different New York City nightclubs over that time, and just uh, realized at twenty eight I'd become emotionally bankrupt, spiritually bankrupt. Uh, I had betrayed you know, all semblance of faith and values from my past and made a huge life change. I, I sold everything I owned, wondered what the opposite of my life would look like, mm -hmm. and I began to apply to humanitarian organizations I'd heard of, the mm -hmm. UNICEFs and Peace Corps and Save the Children of the World. Uh, I'm denied, of course, by all these organizations because they're serious people and I'm some you know, club kid. Uh, and, and finally, one organization says that if I paid them $500 a month, and I was willing to go live in Liberia, I could volunteer. So I gave my credit card details and, uh, and my life really changed. I, I lived in post-war Liberia, uh, a country that Charles Taylor had just completely decimated with a 14-year civil war. And I saw, among other things, people drinking dirty water. And I'd just never seen a child drink from a green swamp before. Uh, I sold $10 bottles of Voss water to people in nightclubs that didn't even open the water. Mm -hmm. And you know, learning that a billion people at the time worldwide lacked this basic need that I'd just taken for granted, being born into a, a middle-class family uh, where water came out of taps. So for me, it was discovering the question behind the question, mm -hmm. um, learning that over 50% of the disease in the world is caused by bad water. Mm -hmm. uh, so half the sick people you know, throughout all these countries didn't need to be sick if they'd had their basic need. So when I think of having observed Charity Water through its evolution, I think of the two keys of success are just the sheer force of character uh, from you, and two, you're innovative. The, the organization and its mission, there are other people doing the same thing right now, um, but it feels like Charity Water is kind of the innovator in the space, using technology. Can you talk about some of the things you've done to, if you will, drag a nonprofit into into the future, if you will. Yeah. I mean, it was a core value. So we were intentional about innovation uh, 10 years ago when we started. I mean, the, the three big pillars of the organization, when, when I started, I had this mission that pretty much everybody could agree on. Like, I never go anywhere and people say, Scott, please stop giving people clean water. You know, humans don't need clean and safe drinking water. So I had, you know, I realized I was onto something there, a universal good, a universal agreed upon mission. But I had the advantage of being 30, living on you know, walk-in closet floor in Soho, and having none of the trappings of traditional establishment charity. I hadn't come out of the World Bank. I didn't know how the UN functioned. Uh, I'd never been inside a bureaucratic charity. So as I start talking to my friends, I realize none of them are giving to charities. They are not giving to these big names that we hear. And I start asking why. And I just absorbed all the objections. I don't know where my money goes. I don't know how much of my money will reach. When I give money, I never see the impact. The charity just keeps asking me for more money. There's a sense of, of ingratitude from the charity. I really got to start with a clean piece of paper and uh, a group of cynical people around me. And I said, well, what would the perfect charity look like to you? And we came up with these three pillars. The first was just, could we find a way to use 100% of the money Every penny we would ever raise, every euro, every pound, uh, every kroner, every single cent ever raised would go directly to the water projects. And uh, to do that, we opened up two bank accounts and I said, I'm going to personally try to raise all the overhead separately. I will go find entrepreneurs, business leaders, maybe venture capitalists to help pay for the unsexy overhead, the staff, the office, the flights, the toner for the copier, so that 100% of the public's money could go. And I realized this would be powerful, taking the number one objection off the table. Um, two stats for you. Recent um, USA Today poll uh, polled Americans found 42% of Americans distrust charities. NYU did a, a, a poll, found 70% of Americans 
either believe charities waste money or badly waste money. So that's the group I was after. 100% of the money would go. Number two, money wouldn't be fungible. So with these two bank accounts, with the public's money never being touched for overhead, we could use technology to track those dollars down to the destination. So if a six-year-old girl uh, went out, uh, sold lemonade, and said, here's $4.21, we could track all 421 to a village in Malawi or a village in Bangladesh, or a village in Guatemala where a water project was built. So that was kind of the proof pillar. And you know, we were fortunate, we, we started the same year Google Earth started, and we realized Google had given us a free place to put all of our water projects so we could make this hyper-transparency bet day one. Other charities were saying, that's crazy, like why would you tell people where your wells are? What if they went and they were broken? We're like, well, we'd want to know that they were broken so we could fix them and figure out what went wrong in the first place. Just this idea of opacity throughout the sector uh, seemed so um, backwards to us. Mm -hmm. um, the third thing was I wanted to build this beautiful brand. And as I looked at the big charities, I, I found that they, they typically use shame and guilt to peddle their wares. They made people feel awful about how much they had. And... If you looked at the sector, there was no Nike, there was no Apple, there was no Virgin, there was no, you know, today, Tesla. Um, charities, you know, they sent mail, paper to people. They bought physical mailing addresses. Y'all remember those commercials, uh, the Sally Struthers commercials, and the sad kids with sad eyes, and the flies landing on their face, and the 800 number, you know, beneath the screen, as we all kind of pull out our wallets and say, oh, this is awful. You know, but nobody wants to evangelize that charity. Nobody wants to wear that T-shirt. Um, I remember early on just, you know, likening it to, to Nike. Like if Nike said, um, hey, fat and lazy people, turn off the TV, stop eating Cheetos and go run, it wouldn't work. We wouldn't be wearing the swoosh. Mm -hmm. But Nike has said for years, there's greatness inside you. You know, you can do far more than you ever thought you could do. So we've just said there's generosity inside you. There's, you have a, a great capacity for human empathy to care for the suffering of people thousands of miles away. Uh, the more you give, we believe the more you'll give, the more you know, this will be unlocked in you. So give away 100%, prove where the money was going. It sounds so simple. Build a beautiful, inspirational, um, hopeful, imaginative brand. Look at it as an invitation. You know? Come with us because it's awesome because we are building a movement to see a day on earth when everyone drinks clean water. Don't you want to be a part of it? Don't you want to tell your kids and your grandkids about it? Um, and then the most important thing is we just wouldn't send people that look like me to actually go do the work. Mm -hmm. Uh, so many NGOs, you know, send well-intentioned Westerners to Africa or India and they dig wells and they're not sustainable and they're not culturally relevant. So our job would be to raise the awareness and the money, get people to care about this issue that didn't affect them, and then all the work would be done through the locals. So we would uh, grow the capacity of their organizations, we would buy them drilling rigs, we would buy them trucks, we would help them hire hydrologists, but they'd be the heroes, they would get the credit. And you've changed the business model. You're trying to, like many companies, moving to more of a software recurring revenue-like model. You're, you're trying to switch to this recurring revenue model. I am. I mean, one of the biggest regrets, really, was that we didn't do that early enough. Um, we, built, we built this extraordinary birthday platform. Um, one of the ideas that we stumbled into that just took off and raised now over $50 million was, uh, was asking people to donate their birthdays. And instead of celebrating themselves through stuff that they don't want or need, ties, wallets, socks. I mean, we, you know, we don't need any of this stuff. Uh, to turn the birthday into a redemptive giving moment and involve all of our friends and family in something really beautiful, not just in the, the buying of more stuff. So I, I stumbled into this uh, years ago, my 32nd birthday, and I thought the sticky marketing idea would be to ask everyone I knew for $32. $32 for my 32nd birthday, 100% would go. And I promised if I raised enough for a well, I would fly out and I would drill it via satellite live for all the donors to see. I wound up raising uh, $60,000. I'm like, wow, everybody has a birthday. Nobody needs more crap. And we saw this explosion of this idea. A seven-year-old kid in Austin, Texas, starts knocking on doors asking for $7. He raises $22,000. We saw 89-year-olds donate their 89th birthday, writing these beautiful mission statements saying, look, I, I, because of the privilege I was born into, I've turned 89. And that's double the life expectancy in so many of these countries. I'd hope my birthday could give people the gift of more birthdays. So that idea just kind of took off. But the problem was that only, people only did one birthday. They had a great experience. They would donate their 16th or their 69th or their, you know, their fourth birthday. Um, they would say that was a great experience. But then they would actually take our idea to another charity. You might do your birthday for clean water this year and for hunger the next year and for health 
the following year. So we, we, ha we never had recurring revenue. Every January 1, we would start at zero. So if we raised $40 million, you know, I would look at my wife uh, January 1 and say, oh my gosh, how Negative can we ever do that again? Uh, like, yeah. I don't know how I could work harder. I went on 96 airplanes last year. I made 150 speeches. Like, it was so daunting. So for our 10th anniversary, uh, we launched uh, in pilot this brand new giving community called The Spring. We said, what if we could get a bunch of people to give a little bit every single month, uh, not unlike a Spotify, Netflix, um, you know, Hulu, Dropbox, HBO type model. And uh, this subscription would be different because instead of us getting the benefit or us consuming the content, 100% of the subscription would get passed on to others. And then Charity Water would need to innovate through storytelling, showing people what their 30 or 50 bucks a month was doing and the impact. So um, we launched that. Uh, we're about to break through 10,000 subscribers in 80 countries, so still very modest numbers. Uh, most people, are the, the average is over $30 a month. So uh, every $30, we can get one person clean water. And that's what I'm really excited to grow. So it's about 7% um, or 8% of total um, donation revenue, but you know, that's growing fast. And I think that'll, be, that'll really be the key to our succeeding at scale in the future is not starting over and building a loyal community of people that we can communicate with month in, month out. So starting over or out there, if there's someone who wants to start a nonprofit and address a very basic human need, what components of the business would you tell them? Yeah. What advice would you have to them? What three or four things? Do this with technology, don't do this. Well, embrace all technology. And you know, when I saw virtual reality a couple of years ago, I thought, okay, here's a tool that's gonna be used probably for pornography, for gaming, right? They're gonna be dark stories, probably, of people led um, you know, in, in maybe some unhealthy places by mm -hmm. this technology. But I'm like, could I lead people to greater empathy and compassion? So we've had over a million donors to Charity Water. I've personally taken about 400 of them to uh, the different countries where we work. But 400 out of a million are a you know, very small number. So I looked at VR and said, could we uh, film one of our water projects, a well being built uh, over the period of a week, have a lead character, a 13-year-old girl who gets clean water for the first time and, and sees this moment where people are allowing me to strap a TV set on their face and give me eight minutes of undivided attention. Can I literally intravenously deliver compassion um, in an empathetic story? And you know, we, this is two years ago when we made a VR film with eight GoPros taped together on a stick. And we shot this really beautiful eight minute film and, and it follows this 13 year old girl and, and you just see her entire life transformed through clean water in six days. And you know, even today, people walk in the office, they put the headset in uh, on their face, you know, they're looking around in 360. Eight minutes later, they're weeping. Tears are streaming down their face. I had one guy walk in uh, he'd already given a, a really generous donation. He was coming in to be thanked by the organization. And he watches the film and he, he throws the, the headset down and he throws his wallet down on the conference table and says, I haven't done enough. And he writes a $400,000 check wow. for 40 wells, 40 communities, just like the one he saw. So, you know, what, whatever the technology, I could give you example after example, our drilling rigs, they tweet. You know, we wanted to connect our donors to where our drilling rigs were at any moment. So we built, uh, we mounted GPS units to them and we built uh, website trackers where you can kind of see where in Ethiopia they are. And we trained our Ethiopian drillers to press a button which sends out a location tweet. Not all the stuff that we've done has worked, but you embrace, like every, every social media platform we have ever heard on on the last 10 years, we're on immediately. We are registering our names, we're putting up some content. Um, we happen to be get the first. We happen to be the first charity to get a million Twitter followers because of that. You know, we're the first charity to use Instagram. So I could probably give you a list of ones that we were on that never amounted to anything. But it wasn't a wait and see approach. That's what most people do. Oh, let's see. Let's let this thing get some traction. Let's not waste any time. Why would we ever do a VR film if VR isn't going to be a thing? Let's wait until it's a thing. And you know, we have used that film now to raise millions and millions and millions of dollars, raise mass awareness. Uh, because we were early, because we were first, because we weren't afraid to try something that maybe didn't become a thing. What platforms have been the most powerful for you? What social platforms? Instagram is, is great because we're such visual communicators. Mm -hmm. So we're constantly putting out photos and videos, uh, dirty water, you know, wells being drilled, people drinking clean water, the stories. I think that that's probably now the most. And how many followers on Instagram? I think we're like 350,000. 
How can people get more involved in Charity Watch, Scott? Well, I'm excited about this spring. So uh, that's this new recurring program. You know, we've got a bunch of people who are just giving $30 a month. So what, it's, uh, it's a few Spotify's, it's a couple Netflix. Um, but really importantly, it's one person that, that moves from dirty water to clean every single month. And, uh, and we're, we're really trying to do some innovative stuff. We just sent a whole content crew to Cambodia and Ethiopia to make dedicated content just for 10,000 people mm -hmm. giving every month. And, you know, again, people would say, why would you allocate those resources? Because it's building community. And if we can show people what their monthly sacrifice is actually doing out there in the world, mm -hmm. they'll become evangelists uh, and they'll, they'll tell others about it. And charitywater.org is the best place to Charity get it. Charitywater.org. Yeah. And uh, typically at the end of these uh, conversations, when I'm speaking to someone who's been incredibly successful in their chosen domain, I say, what advice would you have for a young person thinking about a career? And this is a more difficult question. What advice do you have for a 30-year-old man or woman that doesn't feel, I don't know, satisfied and rewarded in their life as, as you did? Yeah, I would say you got to reclaim your values. I mean, for us, it's values, it's integrity above all else. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we make every decision, you know, is this the right thing to do? Uh, I mean, we, I could give you so many examples where we took the hard road, um, but that is the pillar, like integrity. If you are trying to reinvent charity, if you're trying to restore people's faith, a broken trust, you have to have integrity in everything you do, whether it's the 100% model or whether character, you know, kind of reclaiming character. I think there's so much of the, that's, that's lost these days, and so many people are willing to compromise their integrity, their honesty, um, for money, for success. Uh, we've really not been willing to do that. We're going to leave it there. Scott Harrison, charitywater.org, a quarter of a billion dollars raised, bringing safe, uh, safe drinkable water to the emerging emerging nations. How many people now have safe drinking water because of charity water? 7.3, and the problem is now down at 660 million. So, so I guess we've got about 1% market share. So you've solved 1% of the problem. We need to do more. So everybody's welcome to, to join the mission and, and, and get involved. Great. Thanks very much, Scott. Thanks, man.